Stay tuned to hear all about the latest family travel trends and how it affects you. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. So hey, Tamara, it's been a whole week or so since I last saw you. Have you missed me? I have missed you. I'm excited (laughs) that I get to see you in two weeks again. I know. We really need to work on our presentation. Yeah, we do. (laughs) <laughs> we'll have to tell everybody about that next time. Yeah. So we're all, both of us are settling back into home life. And, but I thought it'd be fun. We should talk about kind of some of the fun we had together in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah. And you actually spent some time in Tempe, right? Before you came down to Tucson. I did in Tempe and in Chandler. So two of kind of suburban cities. And it was, it was great. I was on pretty much an individual press trip, there was a local family that joined us a few of the days. And the Visitors Bureau people for both Tempe and Chandler are amazing. They know their stuff. They're very friendly. And two cities that I have to say for you, I was thinking you would be happy. You could eat and eat and eat and never get bored down there. They have got some great eateries and restaurants and it's pretty cool. Yeah, I definitely want to go back because as you said, you mentioned that you stayed at the Buttes, right? Yes. Maybe and I told you, like, <laughs> Glenn and I have a history at that hotel because the, we met through work and our company used to hold events there. So uh, I want to go back and visit that. Yeah. Well, and me being the sports girl, I was pretty impressed to see that the Marriott Buttes Hotel is right next door to the Spring Training Angels Stadium, which is, if you don't know a lot about Phoenix, um, it's called Cactus League Spring Training. And in Tempe, they host the Angels. So... That's their home turf field, and the Marriott Buttes is right next door. Is that one of the ones that you went to when you were down there in the spring? It is. It's actually where we saw the Kansas City Royals play, so I was pretty excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. So what other things did you do up there? So we did a little bit of hiking. We ate at a lot of restaurants. We had a good – I stayed at a hotel – another hotel that had a lot of history. So we did kind of a little history walking tour. And one of the fun little things I learned about Chandler, Arizona, is that they have one of the most unique Christmas tree displays. It's been covered by, you know, like travel and leisure or, you know, all those big wigs. And it's a tumbleweed Christmas tree that they get there. So that was kind of a cool thing to learn about. And I did a painting class with my hosts. We went to one of those, it was daylight. So it wasn't a wine and paint night it was just kind of a cool crafty paint pottery paint pictures and they have a whole kids section so it was a lot of fun for families we did some shopping we did a legoland and then also they had a sea life one of those you know the in mall legoland yeah. and sea life places yeah. so we did that and i also had a, a nice facial while there I was at the buttes i got to test out their spa and had a little facial while i was down there so no wonder you look so pretty <laughs> Thank you. I felt so refreshed. And then I gave myself a another facial, a do-it-yourself one in Jamaica. So my skin's like raring and ready to go for the winter. Well, I would say like, yeah, definitely after being in Arizona and how dry it was, you probably really needed a nice moisturizing facial. It was amazing the difference going. I was in Arizona and Tucson, like we said, and I actually had to stop into like a Walgreens and buy a aloe gel moisturizer (laughs) because I was so dry. My skin was so dry. And then I went to Jamaica and pretty soon I had no problem whatsoever. My skin was smooth and uh, it was, it's amazing the difference that climate really has that quickly on your skin. It just, it's crazy. Yeah. I see it myself every winter, you know, especially we have forced hot air heat. And so I get so dry and I'm dry to begin with. And I drink so much water throughout the day, but wow, when I was in Arizona, like I could not, I was constantly, remember where I had to yes. go up to the desk and like ask for water because the water from the tap in our bathroom was so warm. And I'm like, no, I need like, I need drinkable water. Yeah. That's so something I noticed all, also in Tempe is like tap water. I could never get cold tap water. That drives me crazy because I, again, I drink a lot of water. So I'll always make sure that I buy a bottle or I love it when they give you a bottle of water in the room. 
but I will go through way more than one. So sometimes I'll just need to refill it in the middle of the night or something. And ew, I do not like, I like cold water. I like my drinks yeah, cold. I agree. I'm with you. Although I do like hot coffee. So, but one of the things I always travel with a water bottle and I lost mine at some point on my trip between sometime between my travels around Jamaica. Did you get one of those nice um, ones that we got at the conference, the vapor ones? I do. I have, I I had those and then I took two that were the leftovers for my girls and my Lizzie is just loving it. She took hers to gymnastics tumbling last night and I love it because she's excited about it, which means she's drinking more water. So that's cool. And they're so convenient, just like little pouches, because I know I usually do travel with my refillable water bottle for the plane and everything, but I have an insulated one the one that Allison had recommended on our Utah episode and um, you know, it, but it takes up space. And so the, the little pouch that you can then just like roll up when you're not using it is perfect. And it has a little carabiner so you can hook it onto your bag. So yeah, I like that. They just need to make it insulated, which I talked to them and apparently they're working on that. Oh, nice. Cause that's my thing for me. I'm with you. I like cold water. So, you know, if you're hot in Arizona, I want cold water. Yeah. Well, it was Rambling. definitely, I know it was definitely hot in Arizona. I mean, when I was down in Tucson, it was in the nineties. And then when I came back here, it was in the thirties. So it was, it was a major, major shock to me. Yeah. It was very, very hot down there. It was hotter. Actually what we experienced in Tucson felt okay to me. What I experienced in Tempe and Chandler was hotter than that. Um, they were just having a hot spell. They said October is one of those months that you, you never really know what to expect, but we actually went out paddle boarding in Tempe and we paddled a bit and then we both were like, okay, we're, we're dying here. So we went ahead and came in and didn't spend the full time out on the lake. So yeah. Well, I came in to Tucson before you got there, so I had a day to explore on yeah. my own. How was that, and by I, the way? Because you went to a pretty popular place. Yeah, I went to Tombstone, which you know you've probably heard about with the movie, and it's just like one of those Western towns that they've kept intact. But I think when I went, I, I didn't know quite what to expect, and I was kind of expecting maybe some cheesy bits, um, but I was still thinking it's going to be historic and, you know, this preserved Western town. Um, but it was definitely more like stepping into an amusement park. And I think part of it was that there was a special event going on called Hell Dorado Days. And it was, there were people from all over the country there dressed up. It's like as if, you know how people go to Renaissance fairs and they get right. all dressed up? Yeah. That's what it was like. So I'm walking around and I'm so confused. You know, like I got up at 4 a.m. Like I am, I'm tired. I just stepped off the plane and I'm like, what is going on? Like, is it always like this or, or what? So finally I had to ask someone like, what's going on here? Yeah. And is, you know, what is it usually like? They're like, well, no, usually there are always some people dressed up. I mean, there are definitely characters that are throughout the town and there's a number of different places that you can go and see gunfight battles, of course, at the OK Corral, but then there are a couple of other things. So there are those kind of reenactor actor types around. Yeah. But this yeah. this one had a lot of, you know, just kind of Western fans as well. So it was it was a little bizarre. I think there's a um, there's a new HBO show. Have you heard of that? Like West Western World, Western World. <clears throat> um, but it kind of takes place in this like Western theme park kind of thing. So that's I felt like I was stepping into that. But it, it was cool. I mean, it was it was definitely hokey. Uh, mm-hmm. I went to one of the gunfights and it was just it was like vaudeville, you know, like yeah. just like the bad acting. And but if you're into it, you know, I mean, people were laughing. You know, it's like one of those things that if you're there and you're watching it, you go along with it. You know, yeah. it was it was it was neat. It was and about an hour from Tucson. I'm glad that I did it because it was something that I think if I didn't go, I would have been disappointed. But I don't think I have to go back. Cool. Yeah, I had something similar, you know, it wasn't as popular or big as something like Tombstone. But when we were in Chandler, one of our nights, we went to a place called Rawhide. And it's almost kind of like a vaudeville dinner theater type place where it feels like an old west. They've got all these old buildings and things like that. And they've got a couple, a big restaurant that's like a famous, a big steakhouse down there. And they do a six gun shooter theater show, which is kind of that, you know, a wild west comedy slapstick 20 minute live action 
stunt show, I guess. And then they had a music yeah. show and then they've got kids. They've got like a little mini petting zoo and they have a little rock climbing wall and they have a couple of fun little rides. And so it was kind of a fun little thing. It's called Rawhide and it's near Chandler, Arizona. And so we did that. So I wonder if we were doing, it seems like we were doing something similar. Um, yeah. On the same night. So well, it's kind of like nice. if people go to like medieval times, you know, yeah. it's, it's that type of thing, like where they're just recreating this, this world that we've read about and, and maybe yeah. seen movies about. So yeah. kind of neat. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, the characters were great there because, you know, you wouldn't even necessarily be interacting with them and they'd just be walking along the streets talking to each other. And like at one point I, on one of the porches, we saw there was some you know, they're in full costume, right? And they're playing checkers or chess or something with each other. And, you know, they don't even notice you. They're just acting like they're living their life. And it's kind of fun. That's what I was thrown by in Tombstone, because I wasn't sure, like, are these people just coming here dressed up? Or are they actually working here? And that's part of their deal. Like when you go to Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, like, you know, that these are just like, like paid reenactors that are walking around and they're having their conversations and living their life as if, you know, they're colonial men and women. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I couldn't quite figure that part. Out yeah. Yeah. Cause there was such Very a mix cool. of them, but yeah. Yeah. So, and then what else did you do? When you- uh, well, that evening I went over to Saguaro national park, which is where they have some of the giant cacti. Yeah. Um, and it's really, it's so beautiful. I was actually meeting up with a couple of other people. So I kind of raced through the drive in because we wanted to take a sunset hike and I would have loved to stop like all along the way and, and take photos because it was, it was really amazing, but got there in time to do the sunset, have some amazing pictures of, you know, those classic desert sunset with a silhouette of the big saguaro uh, cacti. So that was a lot of fun. I, I had thought maybe I would go back again, explore a little bit more, but then with everything else going on, I didn't. But we did, uh, I think you and I both dif- on different days went to also Sabino Canyon, Canyon. Canyon yeah, uh, which was similar. So definitely like, you know, hiking trails and, you know, that perfect desert landscape. Yeah. And we both got to do horseback riding also while we were in Tucson. Yeah, that was a nice kind of refresher for me after our ranch visit this summer. Yeah, I I have to say that it was a little startling for me. Like when I did horseback riding in Montana, you don't have to worry about how wide your horse is because there's not cacti. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a cactus really hit me hard in the shoe. I had cactus stuck in my shoe and one girl got it in her leg really bad. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. I was glad you definitely need close toed shoes and jeans. So. Yeah, it was a narrow trail for sure. And my horse um, didn't like to stay on the trail. So I was like, oh, all right, no. come on, buddy. <laughs> so I was watching out for that. But luckily, I had my cowboy boots and I had my Wrangler riding jeans. So they were giving me lots of protection because yeah. I was eyeing up those thorns as I was getting close to them. Like, OK, yeah. I'm like, OK, the horse has to also realize that they're going to get into its flesh, too. I right. Know. <laughs> so. I, that's what I would think. But. When your legs are on the outside of it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they only worry about their side. <laughs> yeah. It was it was definitely pretty. It was it was different um landscape, but definitely dry and yeah. dusty. Too. Dry and dusty. Yeah, it was at the back of the pack and that dry and dusty was definitely the word of the game for that day. I liked but the uh, the event that we went to at night though at the Tanka yes. Verde. Is that how you pronounce it? Tank Tanque Tonka, Verde? Tonka Verde. At the Tanqua Verde mm-hmm. Ranch because they seem like they have a really nice setup there and that was where gorgeous. we ate was yeah. yeah it was where they do a couple times a week they do their outdoor kind of barbecue events and yeah it was really pretty and they had the guy singing songs and the kind of still go wagon lit up but then nice outdoor area so I would I would like to go back and check that out because it seems different than the ranch that I stayed at like a little bit bigger more amenities. So I don't know. After, after talking to different dude ranches at the Family Travel Association, I'm now you know interested in kind of comparing some different yeah. ones. I'm so sold on that as a great family vacation. Very cool. I need to jump on that bandwagon, it sounds like. so. Good. So I guess we will now talk with Reinard, who is the founder of the Family Travel Association. And he's going to share some of the research that they shared with us at the conference and talk to us about some of the other trends and hot destinations that they're finding in family travel. Okay, 
Okay, so we are here today with Reiner Jens, and Reiner is the founder and president of the Family Travel Association, which is something that Kim and I are both involved with, and we just went to the summit, and so we wanted to have him come on and share a little bit about the association and what he sees going on in the family travel space. So, Reiner, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, like where you live and how you got involved in creating an association? Yeah, well, it's actually a quite a long and winding road at this tale, and everyone, uh, I'm sure, has a you know an interesting story and background to where they have gotten to and how. But uh, I spent most of my career in media and in business development, advertising. Uh, I did so for 13 years actually at National Geographic, where I was publisher of their kids' magazine for about six or seven years, and before that, I. I worked in the travel industry through uh, Business Traveler magazine. I also spent a little bit of time at CNN. But like I said, my uh, focus had always been on kind of the, the business side of media, meaning, like I said, the advertising and circulation and making sure that uh, the bills were paid so that the editorial people could kind of do their thing. Well, that interestingly changed in 2008 uh, when my wife and I, actually four years earlier, had committed to doing something that a lot of people, I think, you know, dream of or fantasize about, but very few actually commit to, and that is uh, kind of packing up your bags and selling your house and kind of deconstructing everything to take a trip around the world. And uh, my wife and I did that, like I said, in 2008. Uh, the twist was that we did it with our two boys, Tyler and Stefan, who were eight and 11 at the time. And before I left, uh, interestingly, I was uh, approached by the editor-in-chief of National Traffic Traveler, Keith Bellows at the time, and he said to me um, that uh, he was very excited and inspired about what I was doing, but then further asked me if I would consider blogging for National Geographic's Intelligent Travel Blog, which at the time was just launching. It was their first foray into uh, the blogosphere, if you will, and um, actually being a little intimidated by A, not knowing what a blog was, but B not having written before, not being a journalist, you know, I was a little apprehensive about jumping into this. But anyway, I decided to to take him up on it. And I started blogging about our 13 uh, month adventure around the world. And what that ultimately led to was, you know, just really by chance, uh, not just through the personal experience that we had, but through the blogging, was that I got very inspired uh, to try to inform, educate and encourage families to travel more with their kids. And uh, like I said, it was a, a long, twisty and windy road. But uh, ended up launching the Family Travel Association in October of 2014, and our goal was pretty simple. We wanted to bring the travel industry together, and by industry I mean you know the suppliers like the cruise lines and the resorts and the destinations that serve families, but also the leading experts who include journalists and bloggers and television personalities, and also now travel agents. You know, kind of bring this group together so that we could all inspire families to travel more. Uh, and I'm proud to say that, you know, two years later, we've really kind of built a strong foundation. Uh, we have over 220 members at this point. I'd like to say the, the members range from KOA to A and K, you know, Campgrounds of America to Abercrombie and Camp, which are very different, but they do serve families, um, you know, equally as as, as inspiring as, uh, uh, as as many of the other companies that, that we work with. So, um Anyway, we we brought together this, you know, kind of uh, force in, in family travel, and now we're starting to initiate programs, whether they're uh, public relations, media initiatives, research projects that, that helps the industry better understand who the consumers are. We've launched a, a website, uh, familytravel.org, which consumers can go to to help them discover what's possible, anything from dude ranches to cruises to volunteer trips. Uh, you know, the, the wide variety of things that families can do. And again, this was all inspired very much by the the, the trip and I, my wife and I uh, decided to take, uh, you know, with our boys back in 2008, 2009. And uh, it's just really exciting to have kind of brought all these uh, different companies and experts all together so that we can do more to, like I said, inspire families to travel and just make sure that, you know, through all this, that uh, parents realize and understand that traveling with their kids is actually quite good for them. You know, that besides it being recreational and fun, it's also transformational and potentially life changing. So uh, there's so many reasons to go out there and explore the world with your kids. And um, it, it could be a, you know, a weekend getaway to a 13 month trip around the world. You know, they they all have uh, tangible benefits and, and 
and reasons for doing it. Do you have a couple of things that you noticed or maybe that stood out that happened with your boys while you guys traveled that kind of helped? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Number one, and, and this is for any parent out there, do not underestimate what your children will engage with, enjoy, like. You know, it, it's, it's incredible how travel can be an opportunity for kids to explore not only the world, but themselves. You know, it, it really helps them discover a little bit of who they are and what interests them. And again, like I said, don't underestimate what those things could be. So don't be afraid to try different types of food with your kids or go to museums or, or places of cultural interest because maybe they didn't like a, uh, a trip that they had taken before. You know, it. Yeah, uh, I totally and, agree. Yeah, and particularly, you know, w- with the kids' age, ours were 8 and 11, like I said, and, and that falls kind of right in the sweet spot of when kids are the most curious, yeah, very interested in the world. So, uh, you know, again, do, do not limit them by your preconceived notions of what they'll enjoy. Um, so that, that was number one. Number two, it didn't take us long to start learning on how to really kind of live while, while being on the road like this, but... Um, it's amazing how many things that we discovered that we had no idea existed or were even possible to do with kids. The one example I'll show is scuba diving. So my wife and I were certified divers. Uh, we had gotten our certifications when uh, right before we got married so we could dive on our honeymoon. And you know, I didn't realize until we were traveling that our boys, who again were 8 and 11, the 11-year-old could actually get a certification. I had no idea that that was possible. I would have expected, you know, 14 or 15-year-old uh, to be able to certify, not a 10-year-old. So um, suddenly we were able to go diving with our kids. And, and, you know, there's endless examples. So rather than, you know, a couple who have their first child and, and think that their travel universe shrinks from, you know, the entire planet to Orlando, cruise ships and all-inclusives, you know, the, the world of possibilities actually still can be quite broad and could even be wider than before you had kids. I mean, I, I would not necessarily have gone to Disney, uh, in, you know, sans children or, or some other, uh, you know, places that, uh, you know, where are family friendly. So by no means does your world become limited when you have children in terms of vacation options. Like I said, I, I would say in some cases they would expand. So really explore what the possibilities are and you'd, and you'd be very surprised. Yeah. I've heard from a lot of families that, um, you know, they're like, well, my kids wouldn't like that. My kids don't like museums. My kids don't like that. I'm like, just give them a chance. You know, just, you know, like you said, you never know until you try. But that kind of makes me think when we were out at the conference, you talked, you guys shared some research and you talked about like the different types of travelers. And I think some are more open to different experiences and, and some are not. Can you share a little bit about some of the research that you guys did and what you found? Yeah, you know, one of the kind of suspicions that we had about the American family traveler was that they are not doing nearly as much travel as they can or should. And the reason I say that is, you know, when I got home and, you know, talking to our friends and family and new people that we met, they'd all be amazed about, you know, all the travel that we've done. But I was surprised how little they do. And these are people who have the resources, who who have the days off, you know, who have the, the things that, you know, you kind of need to take a, a trip, but they're, they're, there's something holding them back. And I wondered, is it cultural? Is it economic? You know, why are all these parents just so kind of, um, you know, timid or, or kind of held back or reserved about traveling? And what we learned in our research was that there are, as you suggested, actually three types of, of family travelers, if you will. There's a group that we call the hassle freeze, and they're the ones that you know just want to make things easy. And look, a lot of parents are stressed and time constrained, uh, no question. So that's why cruises and all-inclusives and even the Disney vacation package is so attractive to them. There's a whole other group, and this is probably the largest, that, that do want to travel further afield, that understand that traveling with their kids is educational and will help them in, in many ways. You know, they're, They kind of understand this, but yet they have bumped into obstacles. Some are financial, um, some are real, and some are, you know, perceptions. They don't know where to go to get information. They're not sure who they can trust. They've got a lot of concerns. You know, is it safe? Can you travel with, you know, uh, Zika out there now and terrorism, all these things? You know, there's a great deal of kind of uh, anxiety and apprehension. Like I said, some of it real and understandable, some of it um, being more of a, you know, misperception. So, uh, and then there's a third group, the intrepid travelers who are like me and my family and, and I'm sure many of your listeners who are 
getting out there and, and going places. But yeah, there's this incredible, you know, big pool of people who just need help. And that's one of the reasons why we're out there, um, to give them help with information on resources, inspire them a little bit. And uh, look, we are arguably one of the, you know, if not the most prosperous, wealthy uh, country in the world. Our kids should be out there traveling as much as anyone's. But yet, you know, these limitations are something, and these challenges are something we're trying to help people overcome. So you mentioned maybe budget and fear for safety. Are there a couple of other things that you think limit people from traveling with their kids? Yeah, I mean, one is definitely the the school vacations. That's an issue. You know, it seems like everyone's spring break falls at the same time. So if you live in the Northeast like I do and you think, you know, unfortunately, maybe sometimes too late or, you know, too too soon before the actual vacation, like, oh, let's head down to Florida or somewhere warm and the airfare suddenly $1,000 a person, you know, that's limiting. You, You need to really prepare. So school breaks are a big challenge and you need to be on top of it and know when you know, on the calendar, these breaks fall. Parents also, interestingly, have said that finding alone time, you know, just time for the, for the parents to be together is a big challenge when they, when they plan a trip. So there are certainly some companies that will, you know, offer great kids clubs or, or programs and services that will allow parents to kind of have a little bit of, you know, a couple time uh, during a trip. So that, that's another issue that, that parents seem to have. And look, even if, you know, economic challenges and affordability is, is by far, like you said, the, the number one issue. And that doesn't just affect, you know, middle class and, and lower income families. Even those that make hundred to $150,000 a year as household income also say that affordability is their biggest issue. I mean, their, their bars higher, you know, they might be going on more expensive trips. So I think that's important for the travel industry to hear so that they make sure to promote the value that the, their vacations offer, you know, and, and not just the, you know, the price tag, but really, you know, that there are options that are affordable. And it, it's, again, something that we're trying to do is present some options that are less expensive and that could be affordable for a family that has maybe four or more, you know, members. So. Yeah, I agree. That's, bring back the good old American road trip too. You know, there's <laughs> so much just that we can see sometimes without, uh, having to deal with these airfares because same thing I'm in the Northeast and wow, when it's spring break, those airfares double and they, they know when it's spring break, you know, but we've actually found ways around that even just by like our up in the Massachusetts, Rhode Island area, our spring break is like maybe a week different than the New York area. So if we can just drive three hours down to New York airports, you can get a much cheaper flight. So sometimes there's ways around it. Hey, you gotta be resourceful, right? Yeah, exactly. So what are some of the other um, trends that you're seeing, like in terms of the types of travel or interest in travel? I know like multi-gen is kind of a big trend. Like what are some other things that you can point to? Well, you just mentioned the, uh, the Great American Road Trip. Domestic travel is definitely on the uptick, no question about it. And Do you think that's because of like terrorism and Zika and things like that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Zika has definitely had an impact. I've been to Mexico and the Caribbean and and talk to tourist boards that are, you know, in that, in that part of the world uh, that has been affected and, and hit by Zika. And there's no question it's having an impact. And look, you know, unless your family is complete, you know, this is, mm-hmm. uh, this is a demographic <laughs> that's going to be affected by Zika, no question. So, yeah. uh, and look, there's been a lot of chatter about the river cruising category. And, you know, I think that led by Adventures by Disney and some other suppliers who are, are offering river cruises, they're, they're making them more family friendly. I mean, they're really seeing that this is an important uh, market. And yeah, that's growing. You know, look, the, the cruise line industry has no doubt been playing into the affordability uh, challenge that parents have and, and the, the desire that families want to make their kids happy. So they're creating water slides and, you know, all these kind of entertainment products on board that are kid friendly. Um, so they're, they're really targeting families heavily and cruise ships continue to see an uptick. I, I don't expect that to die down anytime soon. But interestingly, in terms of destinations, I just spent some time with travel agents uh, last week and asked them what they're seeing. And Iceland, interestingly enough, (laughs) has grown in popularity among families. And uh, I have a kid, so I've got to talk about what we're missing here. I went last year and I'm going actually going back in next week. I'm going back. Yeah, so I'm excited by that. But I don't know if you saw the stat that said that um, next year more Americans are going to be traveling to Iceland than there are Icelandic people. 
<laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I will say from planning trips with families, you know, I field uh, inquiries all the time from people interested in doing it. But just my little tip for anyone listening, like ple- you have to plan at least six months in advance because there are just not a lot of hotels and it books out like just really early. So yeah. plan ahead. <laughs> Good to know. And look, there's no question that the airlines definitely have an impact on destinations that uh, are hot or not. Yeah. Uh, so because Iceland uh, Air, you know, has offered some great rates, and there are yeah. more airlines servicing Iceland. And you know, look if, again, if you've got a family of four, and you you mentioned driving down to New York to get air, airline deals, yeah, I mean, Europe has gotten very expensive to fly to, and um, parts of Mexico that are now having direct flights from from New York, and other parts of the Caribbean that now have direct service, you know, that changes the the trends and and kind of hot spots and where families go. There's no question sure. that that has an impact. Do you um, ever find, you know how Lonely Planet puts out their uh, top destinations every year? Have you seen mm-hmm. that? They named Canada as the top for 2017. Do you see that, I don't know if you've tracked this or seen it, but have you seen when things like that, those top places to travel, do you think that encourages people to go to those places or do you think those places are just called from studies where they're seeing where people are going or anything like uh, that? Probably a combination of both, but do that, does that have an impact? Uh, yeah, I would think it Yes, absolutely. You know, there's no question that Google searches and things like that love top 10 lists. And I, I remember contributing to the Travel Channel's list of kind of hot family travel destinations. And and by the way, Alaska is something that I recommended at the time. And Alaska has seen definite growth among families and not just via the cruise ships. And places like Costa Rica have definitely grown. But yeah, there's, there's no question that people are looking at those lists. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, Africa is is going to be hotter, literally and figuratively, mm-hmm. because they are creating more product for families and more affordable options to go on safari. And in South Africa, for example, the dollar is really strong against the rand. Mm-hmm. So there are some real value opportunities. And like I said, some of the safari companies are now allowing children as young as six to go on game drives. And, and there were some that didn't allow any children uh, before. So they're really opening up their doors more for families. And What do you think is like an average uh, price for a family to do a safari? I feel like a lot of people are interested, but just don't, you know, we have this concept like, oh, it's so difficult between like, you know, who to use, it's so far away, all kinds of other concerns about the shots you have to get and everything else. But the, you know, the logistics, the price I think is a huge one. So can you, do you have any sense of like what the range is? It, well, I would say for a family of four, uh, that you're probably looking at, you know, twelve thousand dollars, twelve to sixteen, you know, depending on on how long you go and what mm-hmm. you do. And that's and now, not even including the airfare, probably, right? No, that that would include airfare. Okay. Um, and look, you as you mentioned earlier, uh, six months out, absolutely. For Africa, you should plan eight, to ten months out, uh, if not a year out. And yeah. We'll that, but secure the airfare, and that's the most important thing. And then you can work with a number of tour operators to help you get you know, all the accommodations and the safari lodges and so forth. Yeah. And re- this is something that parents probably don't have time or the knowledgeable background on. But if you plan, if you could literally plan your own African vacation, everything from the, the hotels to the safari lodges, et cetera. And if you did it yourself, uh, you could probably save a, a good chunk of money. But tour operators are terrific when it comes to this. Um, if you've got the budget, and again, they work with different price points, they will set up something, you know, fantastic for you. And like I said, the the dollar is so strong against the rand that the, the prices are dropping. Right. Yeah, I remember. I think Eric Stone, when we interviewed him, he had mentioned that he kind of did some legwork and went privately through. I think he went via. He went with the local, like um, a local tour guide, um, booked it all himself, as opposed to going with a tour operator, and you know, saved a lot of money that way. The average family, even those with the resources, meaning the you know the the budget and the pocketbook, uh, it's, most do not have have time to really you know get dig deep and do it themselves. Yeah, and, and it would be. I mean, you need guidance for sure. But you know, there are more and more, and this is a trend I would like to see. Not really a trend, but uh, you know, a category I'd like to see grow more. Look, travel agents are really there to help families uh, with their vacation plans, and they could save them money. They can get them upgrades and amenities that they wouldn't be able to get on their own. But Amy O'Shaughnessy, for example, who started Chow Bambino, you know, she's more of a less a travel agent, but more of a consultant, you know, and who really helps put vacation packages together. And, you know, it's not just commission based. It's with a fee. 
You know, like I will save you time and money and particularly time by her doing it and paying for that consult and, and that expertise, you could save money than going directly with a door operator. So, you know, and again, when it comes to the subject of travel agents, they're terrific for booking cruises, all inclusives, Disney vacation packages, things along those lines, because they get highly incentivized to do so by the suppliers. But when it comes to things like dude ranches or safaris or things that are more off the beaten path, working with a travel consultant like uh, you know Amy O'Shaughnessy at Chad Bambino or, or others, those that, again, can, can privately set up uh, and arrange travel arrangements, they, uh, that's a great way to go. Yeah, it's Tamara. Being, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, as a yeah. as a travel planner, as a travel advisor for Chow Bambino, I will agree with that. <laughs> but, yeah, so, exactly. Like what you know, if you if there's someone that you work with that really knows the market and that knows families and can bring those resources together, it's such a time saver. So, yeah. So have at it. You know. Yeah. Spread the word because it's really um, you know it's important for for families to know a that they have resources they can trust, but b ones that can really look at someone's budget and, and find options, you know, as I said earlier, that they may not have known even existed or thought were possible. So yeah. It's and it goes back to that kind of that big, you said that large sector of the middle, you know, people that have the resources and can travel, but they don't know where to start or they're scared or, you know, all those things that are holding them back. It, those, those travel consultants and travel planners really can help those, yes. you know, that, that demographic. So no question. And like I said, there are some terrific travel agents out there that can do that. Uh, most travel agents, again, are going to be very much leaning towards the vacation packages and the cruises and the all-inclusives because that's what they're incentivized to sell and that's what they know. That's um, a great but, tip. Yeah, I, I'm all for making sure we expand people's understanding of all the different possibilities, not just a few. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, along those lines, what are some of the other ways that families can kind of take advantage of what the FTA has to offer? I mean, I think you mentioned some of the resources on the website, like the listings of very family-friendly tour operators and destinations and cruise lines and all the rest. But how else can families take advantage of what the FTA is doing? Well, I would uh, absolutely encourage them to you know go to our website, sign up for the newsletter. We have a uh, both industry, but you know, relatively new consumer newsletter where we will send out information you know, once, twice a month on not just deals or offers or things kind of happening in the industry in terms of you know, those kind of news items, but you know, stories that really inspire and shed light on issues around family travel that they may not have thought of, again, on, on how it could be an educational resource and so forth. So uh, the newsletter is definitely something that we hope and encourage them to sign up for. Uh, our media center, which has a, you know, which, which, is, which are great resources for them. You know, we don't necessarily want to have the FTA be the only website families ever visit when it comes to family travel. We, we certainly can't or won't do it all or claim to ever do that. You know, we want to make sure that they see the resources. So we want to make sure that we're telling them about the child bambinos of the world and the family vacation critic website and, and some of the others that are doing some really good things. So it, it hopefully becomes a place for them to start exploring, again, possibilities, but also acquire information on resources that they can access to you know, learn more about how to plan your um, African safari, as we discussed, or you know, to, just, just to kind of give them ideas and then, and then point them in the right direction. It's very helpful. I know that also you guys were a pretty big factor in um, you're trying to help push through legislation to help families sit together on airplanes. So families have issues or something, you guys are also a good voice to kind of talk to about some of those things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, that uh, that's something that we'll disseminate through uh, our website and, and our communications. But we also work very closely with our media partners and our media center members to make sure that they distribute the information to their communities and their um, audiences that they have. And like I said, there are several websites and bloggers out there who've, who've built up these, you know, terrific communities and, and networks of families who are, you know, really interested in, in learning more about family travel. So we don't necessarily have to grab them all and bring them to our site, but we want to make sure they get our information. So we'll work with our, our media partners to make sure that information gets out there to them. Okay, and we'll just ask you our last question that we ask all of our guests, and that is, what do you like to wear when you travel? Well, it's a family travel show or <laughs> uh, program here, but 
the underwear that I always that I've worn ever since our around the world trip has been ex officio. Uh, yeah. And uh, my kids still tease me about it because uh, I bought them for the trip uh, and haven't haven't ever haven't worn any other brand since. So <laughs> ex officio, they're they're a little expensive, but uh, it's a terrific product, and I haven't left home without them for years. That's so funny. I was wondering where that was going to go. <laughs> I was too. <laughs> Well, you those know, are great for like washing out and they dry really fast too, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know what? I've also got into a habit and it's it started with our around the world trip where I don't stress about packing everything that I need for a trip because I'll often buy stuff when I'm there at a destination. I, I, I like shopping actually uh, when I travel, particularly for clothes. So when I'm in California, I'll buy, you know, my, my bathing suits or, uh, you know, t-shirts or whatever. And if I'm in Canada, you know, that's a good time to look for a fleece or things like that. So yeah, I actually like shopping for clothes when I'm travel. Well, when that's you go to cool. Iceland, I'll have some good tips for you. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Cool. Well, thank you for being here today. Can you tell our listeners where they can follow your travels and where they can find the yeah, Family Travel easy. Association? Thanks. Yeah. The Family Travel Association is uh, at familytravel.org. And you can follow us on Twitter at Family Trav Associ. And um, my personal information is reiner at familytravel.org. That's R-A-I-N-E-R at familytravel.org. If you want to reach out, I'm always happy to answer my emails and any correspondences. And thanks so much for having me on your show. Thanks so much Absolutely. for joining us, Reiner. It was great chatting with you. And Yeah. And remember, uh, all you listeners, uh, learning happens not just between the ears, but between the poles. I love that. <laughs> That's good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we will be sure to keep the listeners up to date on all what's going on with the Family Travel Association. Hey, thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. We are back with our tip of the week. And I just thought this is something that I forgot about and realized when I was in Arizona. So I wanted to let you know that Arizona doesn't participate in daylight savings time. And so sometimes for me on the East Coast, they are two hours behind and sometimes they're three hours behind. And I totally forgot about this. And I was out there thinking it was one time at home. And then I got a call and I'm like, what are you guys doing home already? And they're like, it's 10 o'clock. I'm like, oh, you're three hours behind me. Oops. So just make sure that you use your phone or do something to check the local time so you don't show up late to your appointments um, when you're in Arizona, if you can't keep track of what time zone they're in, depending on the time of year. Yeah. And Google is always nice for that. You can always type in, what time is it in Phoenix, Arizona? Yeah. And they will tell you. Because <laughs> sometimes my phones don't always update. Yeah. Got to love Google. Yeah. Cool. So I had the same thing happen, by the way, because uh, my daughter, I said, why are you calling me? How could you run already? And she's like, mom, it's four here. So same thing happened to me. I just want to mention really quickly that next week we are going to be talking about ski vacations with Mara. And I'm excited to talk more about that because we are entering the ski season for a lot of people. I know out here in the West, Thanksgiving kind of marks the big start of ski season. So hopefully everyone everywhere will have an awesome ski season and our tips will help get you out on the slopes. So until next time... 